Hey, uh, today we, we've, we've kind of come to a point where we've looked at participant powers in the spiritual realm. We've talked about those different dynamics. We talked offensive strategy, what God has called us to do to wage war in the spiritual realm. We've talked last week about defensive strategy, what God is calling us to, to do to just not just defend ourselves, but to defend ourselves and those around us against the adversary and his ploys. Today, our discussion is going to be on win condition, not wind condition, which is a different thing. Win condition. I love tabletop games. Now, when you hear tabletop games, you might be thinking Monopoly or Sorry or Candyland. I hate those games. I despise Candyland. That kind of thing is just painful. Rather, I prefer complex tabletop games that require strategy, community, usually a game that's got a robust rule set, maybe a bit of complexity, problem solving, some thought required, you know? Now, learning a game directly from a manual is hard. I don't know if you've ever done that. Open a box for a brand new game and start tearing through the manual and try to figure out what you're supposed to do. It can be done, but it tends to take longer, and in my opinion, is suboptimal. I find the best way to learn a game is to have the rule set, but also to sit down with seasoned players who already know what they're doing. And they can explain it to you as you go along. They, they give you strategy. They help inform your decision-making process, so you really get to understand things. One of the first questions that any tabletop gamer asks when they sit down to learn a new game, what happens at the outset is they'll ask this question. What is the win condition? What is it that I have to do to attain victory in this day? How do I win? What is my opponent doing? What are my opponents trying to accomplish? What is the antagonist trying to accomplish? How do I lose? Without that information, not only can you not play the game effectively, but the whole situation seems to be bewildering, right? And, and maybe even a bit unfair if you don't understand what a win looks like in the game. This whole situation is like the spiritual situation. What is true of a tabletop game is more true of our spiritual condition. Being born, finding yourself alive, guess what? You're in the game. You're playing the game. You're here on the board, and you're trying to figure things out. Now, there are many people who are rolling dice. They're shifting pieces around on the board. They're picking up cards, but they've never actually stopped to ask that question. What are we doing here? What am I trying to accomplish while here on planet Earth? Just like a tabletop game. It's far easier when you don't just use the rule book. In our condition, that would be the Bible, right? The Word of God. But it's great when you've got other players explaining it to you, and that would be the church. Other individuals who are seasoned at following the rule set and explaining it to you. Both of those things present make it much easier to learn the game. But this week, I want to look at specific win conditions for everyone at the table. In particular, we want to know what a win looks like for God. What does a win look like for those who are on God's side? What does a win look like for the devil? What would a win look like for you? What is the win condition in the spiritual realm? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we dip into this, Father, again, I ask your insight and understanding. Help us to see this world and the spiritual powers that, you, that are in play here through your eyes. I pray that we would go forth from this place where, with significantly more clarity on what we're supposed to be doing. Lord Jesus, would you be with us to train us and teach us today? It's in your most precious name we pray, and by your blood we pray. Amen. Let's start by talking today about what a win looks like for God. What does a win look like for God? You've probably seen a few lopsided contests in your day, right? You know, where one side heavily overmatches another. I once watched a tug of war between a human being and a bear. That went fast. Got pulled down in the mud really quick. I was reading this past week about a girls' basketball game that ended with a score of 161 to 2. Some coach is just cruel. Um, ESPN cites the number one sports blowout of all time as the 1940 NFL championship game in which the Chicago Bears defeated the Washington Redskins 73 to nil. Painful. None of these things, none of these things compare with what is going on in the spiritual realm right now. There is a lopsided victory that is taking place. What does it look like when an all-powerful entity with all knowledge decides he would like to win a game? 
In this series, we talked about how powerful Satan is. The devil is powerful, immensely powerful. The devil is ridiculously smart, more smart than any human being or any collective of human beings who has ever been. But how much is infinite? A million seems like a lot, right? What's the difference between a million and infinity? It's an infinite set. What's the difference between a trillion and infinity? An infinite set. You didn't, you didn't close the gap at all. The gap is infinitely far. And the same is true when it comes to spiritual powers and the realities of spiritual powers. God is infinitely beyond what the adversary is. So let's ask this question at the outset. Can God lose? Can God lose? If you were infinitely smart, would you ever get a game board out and set a game up on the table when you knew you would lose? Do you like losing? Uh, most of us generally don't play games unless we feel like we can at least be competitive. Isn't that true? Uh, my son Demarion uh, likes uh, Madden, the football game. Now, I know enough about football that I can enjoy watching football. I do not know enough about football that I can effectively play the game Madden. I don't know how to call plays, and so I've only played it with him one time. And he beat me by 40 points, 40 some points, and uh, I don't think I scored. Uh, so it was, it was a, a spanking. He took me out behind the woodshed, as it were. I have not played that game since. I have no intention of playing that game with him again. I know that I'm not going to win that game. He knows that if I were to play that game again with him, it wasn't because I thought I was going to win. It was because I was just being a nice dad and letting him tromp on me again. Now, now that said, why would God start a game that he wasn't going to win? If we were created for a relationship, if God knew that he was starting out this whole endeavor in order to create a new family for himself, and he knew that that family was not going to come about, why would he have ever created anything? And the answer is, he wouldn't have. Why would God start a game he wasn't going to win? If God's omniscient, he knows how things are going to turn out. He wasn't shocked by anything that happened in the whole history of the cosmos. It's not like the adversary really pulled one off against him in the garden. God knew that was going to happen. He had already planned for that to happen. So what's going on? I want you to think about all of human history. I want you to try to think about history from the watcher's perspective. Think about it from the perspective of angels, of demonic powers, of world forces, these powers that exist that are not God. They're not omniscient. They're not all-knowing. So I want you to think about what the unfolding of human history looks like to them. Here's God. He creates this new family. He's walking with Adam and Eve in the garden, and something happens. Human beings fall. Oh, maybe the next generation will be faithful. Nope. What about the next generation? Maybe the next generation will become those who could be part of God's family. No, they're not either. Neither the next or the next or the next. And for these angelic powers, they're probably watching this go on throughout history and going, will there ever be a winner? It looks like everybody's going to lose. It looks like the devil is spanking God in this game. What was the devil's original intention there? To separate God from humanity. And what do we see happening over and over again on the world stage? Humans separated from God. Something then happens. And I want you to again think about this from the watcher's perspective. God is not just a player anymore. He's not just standing over the board, but Jesus arrives in flesh. God moves from being a player to being a piece on the board. Now, what happens? What happens in the angelic realm when they see this transpire? You, now, you've seen this, right? Before, you've, you've looked at this story where the angels show up and they're like, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill upon men on, on whom his favor rests. And they, they're freaking out. Why did that happen? Is it because God ordered them to? No, it's because they've been watching and they're wondering, when is this all going to turn? When is something going to happen? Jesus appears and they're like, oh, something's about to happen. And so what do we see in the biblical context? We see total domination through the person of Jesus Christ. Well, God looked like God was losing, looked like God was resigned to lose this game in every respect. Jesus shows up and God flips the board, not like in a temper tantrum style, but like turns it all around such that what looked like loss is now winning. Total domination became the defeat 
uh, it was nearly instantaneous on the cross. Victory was sealed up with the resurrection of Christ. Here's what Paul says to the Colossian church about this in Colossians 2, 13 through 15. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us of all of our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile toward us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. That is, God made a public display of powers, principalities, world forces, the devil and all his minions, by triumphing through, over them through him, that is, Jesus. So think about what this looks like from a spiritual perspective. Everything changes with Jesus' death on the cross. Sin is now dealt with in such a way that the gate of heaven is opened to those to whom it was closed. And Jesus doesn't wait around for the mass of humanity to come believe in him in order to go gloat. He steps in front of the adversary. We see that right after he dies, he is in this realm, and he is speaking to the powers and principalities and world forces, and he lets them know that he has absolute victory. It's a bit like a chessboard where everything looks super lopsided in favor of one player. And then the prime, the one, the greatest piece that the player losing has is taken off the board. And as soon as that piece is taken off the board, it's like God leans back and goes, checkmate. You took my best, and now every move from here on out is going to be you losing. And this is what we see in cosmic history. So how will this all play out? Sometimes in a game, you can see who's winning and surrender occurs. But in this instance, the losing side will not forfeit. Every last play is going to be played until the game is over. God's conquest in Christ is going to play out one piece at a time. That's what's happening right now. You are in that game where Christ is winning one victory at a time, bringing one more person into eternity and one more person into eternity and one more person into eternity, dominating the board on behalf of the Father. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 26 describes this exact scenario. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. After that, those who are, Christ, or who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God and Father, when he has abolished all rule, all authority, all power, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. So you see what's happening here. The description is Jesus is ruling, and gradually he is bringing all, of, all cosmic order under his feet, under his absolute rule. So, that's what we're seeing right now. What's the holdup? Why won't God absolutely dominate here? Any guys ever play the game Mortal Kombat? <laughs> yeah. Some of you are like, yes. Some of you are like, that's a bad game. <laughs> Mortal Kombat was a video game that introduced the, fa the, fa the fatality motif in video games. Fatalities. This is when a player was completely dominated and they would just sit like idle and you were given one chance to go over and, and kill them in the most gruesome ways possible. And this was announced with the statement, finish him, right? And the idea was you go over, you destroy this person, you could enter certain codes so that you, it was just, you rip out their spine. It was horrible. Now, some of us are looking at this cosmic order, and if you've been paying attention to the cosmic order, you probably have learned to hate the devil by now. If you pay attention to your own life, you've probably seen situations where you're like, I hate I hate what's going on here. I hate the way he destroys lives. I hate the way he corrupts and distracts and misleads. And there's part of you that's going, finish him, right? God, would you just end this, this entity? Would you just finish this off? So why is he waiting? Why is this not happening yet? The victory is won, but not all of the objectives are complete. It's another gamer term. By the way, if you hate board games and hate video games, I'm sorry. I've got a lot of illustrations from games today, <laughs> just the way it worked out. There's another gamer term called a completionist. A completionist is a person who wants to play the game and win every single objective in the game. So if they get to the end of the game and they realize they missed something, they'll reset, go back and start over because they want to get every single thing they can possibly get out of the game. God is a sort of completionist. 
There's a sense in which God wants to take everything he can take before this game is done. To take it all in. To win, absolutely. And he is accomplishing secondary and tertiary missions as time goes on. He won in Jesus Christ. He could end space-time history right now and he would be done. What's he waiting for? 2 Peter 3, verse 7 and 8. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. That term reserved, you know what that means. He's already won. He's setting it aside. He's, he's waiting. There's a time that's going to come where all will be unmade. What's he waiting for? Verse 8. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved. That with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about keeping his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So God's objective isn't merely victory. God's objective is maximal victory. There is a certain number of people who will come to salvation, and God is waiting until they are all brought in. Make no mistake, though, there comes a time where not one more person will be saved. And God knows exactly when that time is, and the scriptures indicate that when that time arrives, that he will come like a thief in the night. You will not expect it. People will be going about their business, and suddenly the end will be upon us. So what is God trying to accomplish? Well, he's already accomplished it on the cross, salvation for all humanity, the restoration of a family to himself. But secondarily, he's waiting patiently for us to carry out the mission that was given to us so that maximal, a maximal number of people will be brought into the kingdom. What about the devil? What's his win condition? My family likes to play a card game called Nerds. It's a card game that's sort of like a speed version of group solitaire where everyone playing places uh, their card decks in the middle as they're going. They build up these stacks in the middle, uh, and they're racing against one another. If you want, ever want to make, humiliate me, if it's your objective to make me feel stupid, have me play a game of high-pressure speed observation and organization. <laughs> I am terrible at it. I am the worst. Everyone in my family beats me, uh, at, at least sometimes, but usually most of the time. I have never beaten my wife in this game, nor my son-in-law, nor my daughter. Every time I play with them, they always win. Uh, I, most of my, I say my game, my family likes this. Aiden doesn't like it. He and I are of a similar mindset. <laughs> He played it one time, he's like, I hate this. <laughs> I still play the game. I, I play the game because uh, most of my family likes it, and so we sit down and we play. But I know I'm not going to win, so you know what I do? I find other objectives that I can reach. I want to go through this entire deck. I want to go ahead and play almost a full game of solitaire here in front of me. Right? And I do that because I know I'm not going to win. In a sense, Satan is doing the same thing. The devil is about trying to accomplish other objectives. Why? Because he knows there is no victory for him. Revelation 20. Turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20. The devil understands he is beat. He is no fool. And he sees where all of this is leading. Now his defeat has been pronounced by the one who declares the end from the beginning. And the devil has had access to scriptures. As they're coming out, he knows what is being said. A word of prophecy has not been hidden from him in the sense that he knows what the prophecies say, but it has been hidden from him in terms of how those prophecies are fulfilled. So what do we see when Jesus emerges on the scene? We see that the adversary has no idea what is going on, is ultimately duped, and ends up accomplishing God's mission for Christ, having Christ put to death on the cross. Satan, I said, is smart. Has he been paying attention, do you think, since the time of Christ? I bet he's paid attention. I bet he's paid very careful attention to every single thing that has been written throughout the New Testament context, to every writing and every phase of history, looking at what's happening in history because he has other objectives he's working on. He knows he's not going to win. Look at Revelation 20, verses 7 through 10. When a thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out and deceive the nations which are in the four corners of earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for war. The number of them is like the sand on the seashore. And they came upon the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil will, uh, who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever 
and ever. The devil knows how this is going to go down. He's seen it in the pages of Scripture, and he knows this is his end. Now, if you knew the board was decided against you, if you knew this was your objective end, that this is where you were headed, what would you be focused on right now? You can't win. You're not going to be able to overthrow God. You cannot conquer an infinite entity who's all-knowing and all-powerful. So what would you be focused on? Now, to be fair, I hope you don't think too much like the devil, but I bet you could figure it out, right? I bet you can think about what he might be up to. Uh, first thing I want to point out is he's fighting for vengeance. He's fighting for vengeance. Last week, Sean mentioned the game Risk 2210, and I had just a beautiful regression in my mind, remembering those days with the youth group playing that game over and over again. And let me tell you a story about Sean, because Sean had a particular strategy that I remember to this day. Very highly strategic game. Sean, once he realized he was not going to win the game, would buy a nuclear commander, which meant he had nuclear options. Now, here's what this means for you who don't know this game or what I'm talking about. It means Sean knew he wasn't going to win, but he knew someone else wasn't going to win because he bought this commander. And so what he would do is, do you remember this? He would, he would wait... <laughs> He would wait until someone started winning. And it was, everybody had to, the whole board changed because as soon as one person started winning, they knew Sean was going to kill them. <laughs> he wasn't going to win the game, but someone else wasn't going to win either. And this is really what Satan's about in large part with this vengeance policy. He knows he's not going to win, and he wants to make sure you are not going to win either. The devil's first goal was to separate human beings from God. In the garden, the serpent appears, and the serpent seems to want to drive human beings away from God. And he works very hard at it, and he succeeds at it. At least it seems like he succeeds. If you ever ask yourself, what's the motivation of the devil at that stage of the game? Why would he want human, why would he not want God to have this other family? It seems maybe there was some jealousy there, or something was going on where he's like, I don't like the level of attention that God, that Yahweh is paying to these creatures. I want to make sure that I sever this relationship. And he knew that he couldn't do it. So you know what he did? He had them do it. He turned the human beings against God. He caused them to sin. And he knew God cannot embrace somebody who has fallen. Satan himself ends up falling at that stage of the game. And like most people who have a bad experience, does Satan blame himself? Who does he blame? Probably you and I. I don't think Satan is riddled with remorse over what he did. I think he's riddled with hostility toward those entities that he perceived to have caused his downfall. That hostility has not waned over the course of history. It's only grown stronger and stronger. We see in the scriptures that a war in heaven has occurred. Uh, at least one, probably more than one war in heaven has occurred as the result of the fall. You remember Jesus when he's talking to his disciples after they've come back from preaching the gospel message, and they're freaking out. They're like, even demons are subject to us in your name, Jesus. And he goes, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. This seems to describe a condition the adversary is now in. And I think we read about that condition in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 through 12. Revelation 12, 10 through 12. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. You see the position of the adversary? He was still allowed in the divine council, and he was offering accusation against who? Against us. You cannot have a relationship with them. You are pure and holy. They are fallen. Verse 11, and they, that's us, overcame him, that is the devil, because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives even when faced with death. What is this word of their testimony? Remember how weeks ago we talked about how one of your weapons in this warfare is the word of God going forth from you. Who has a testimony? Just me? You know what a testimony is? It's your story. You have a story of coming to know God. Then you have a testimony. 
And the idea is the blood of Christ empowers that word, your story, to actually change people's lives. They overcame the adversary by the blood of Christ and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives even when faced with death. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But listen to this. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. He's mad. He is on a vengeance mission. And who is it against? Us. So then the devil's bound to earth, he's angry about losing, he's going to take it out on humanity. His first objective to separate human beings from God has become an obsession of his, separating humans from God. Moreover, if he can't make you his, he wants to make you suffer. 1 Peter chapter 5, 8 and 9, Peter says this, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert, your, the adversary, or your adversary, the devil, did you notice whose adversary? Your adversary. Uh, does the devil pose a real threat to God? No, when we call the devil Hasatan, the enemy, we're talking about our enemy. But your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking for someone to devour, but resist him. Stand firm in your faith, knowing the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. A vengeance mission might be separating you from God, but if he can't separate you from God, he wants to just hurt you. And that's part of what he's about. So he's got a vengeance mission, but it's more than a vengeance mission. He's fighting to postpone the inevitable. Turn to Matthew 24. Fighting to postpone the inevitable. Remember telling your kids it's bedtime? Only to see them suddenly find a list of things that desperately need doing before bed? Or perhaps they're just really dragging out the process of doing the bedtime rituals, getting ready for bed averting the inevitable end of the day. To some degree, the devil is about the same business. He is on a mission to postpone. We've said that the devil knows the scripture. Um, here's an important scripture, Matthew 24, verse 14. Matthew 24, 14. A truth that is made plain. This is Jesus talking about the fall of the temple and the end of the age. Here's what he says about the end of the age. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony, a story told to all the nations, and then the end will come. I know. Audio Bibles are awesome, <laughs> except sometimes in church, but that's okay. It is great. Avail yourself of the audio Bible. Uh, if you can do it outside of the service, that's even better, but it's fine. It's fine. So, so what we read in this passage, what the devil has read in this passage is this. When the kingdom of God is proclaimed to all the nations, when all the nations have heard, then the end will come. And there's a sequence there. And the sequence says that before God returns, before the end of all things, all the nations have to hear about God. It has to go forth. So if you're in the devil's position, you know what's coming next. That lake of fire doesn't sound so good. You begin looking for how you can stave this off. If I know step one has to happen before step two happens... I need to stop step one from happening. And the devil is about it. You might have noticed in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, that we overcame the devil because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. This is that offensive strategy. This is the word going forth. This is you carrying out the great commission. So what's the devil about with regard to you? He wants to keep you from doing it. He wants to keep me from doing it. The devil's game, now that he knows he is beat, is to fight for vengeance and to fight to postpone the inevitable by preventing the gospel from going forth. So I want you to think about the win conditions we've seen so far. God's win condition is this. It's already done. Jesus did it. It's fulfilled. But secondarily, he really wants as many people to join his family as possible. And you're part of that program. The adversary's win condition, once we know that, it, it, everything becomes clear for us. The adversary's win condition is this. He wants to separate you from God. He's your adversary, which means you need to work to not be separated from God. And then he wants to keep the gospel from going forth into the other nations so that he can postpone the inevitable. See what's happening here? Now, has your mission become clear yet? I hope so. If you know that God is the absolute winner and you know what he wants and you know that Satan is the penultimate loser and you know what he's trying to accomplish, your mission should be dramatically clear. What's, let's talk about the win condition for humans. Turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5. 
If anyone has ever asked you the question, what is the meaning of life, are you ready to answer? If you're a Christ follower, you should be able to succinctly answer this question. It should be evident to you. Here's your mission in life. Here's how you win. Ready? It's twofold. Number one, come into a relationship with the Lord our God. Number two, help other people do the same. That's it. That's life in a nutshell. If you want to see whether or not you are a winner in cosmic history, accomplish those two things. Come into a relationship with God, help other people do the same thing. Well, how do I know? How do I know I'm family? How do I know I'm in? Well, I hope you've seen the offensive strategy should assure you of this. If you have surrendered to God, if you have been baptized into Christ, if you have fellowship with the people of God, if you have devotion to the word of God, you're in. But you might be asking, yeah, but can I be sure? Can I really, really know? I mean, I really want to know. I'm like this with a few things. Every time I've got to fly somewhere, I don't know if you're like this or not, Every time I've got to fly somewhere, I go through the same checklist like a dozen times and then like another dozen times. I'm like, passport there? Passport there. It's in that pocket. All right. Driver's license is here. I remember my wallet. Remember my wallet this time. No knives? No knives. All right. <laughs> uh, and, and, and just kind of rolling through all of these things that have to be in play. And, and I think sometimes we're that way when it comes to the salvation issue. At least, at least I still am. Do you occasionally go back and just go, man, do, do I know I mean, am I sure that I'm doing exactly what God wants me to in this life? Am I sure that I'm the winner? I want to be a winner. Who is on the Lord's side? This really determines what a winner is. It's the same as asking the question, who wins? Who is on the Lord's side? Here are the indicators that you're there. Let's look at 1 John chapter 5. We're going to be in 1 John chapter 5 for just a, a little bit here, even though I'm going to dance out a little bit. So you just keep right there. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1 through 3. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know, got your Bibles? Underline that. By this we know. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. How do you know you love God? How do you know you're his? What should you do? I heard it from one person. What should you do in order to demonstrate? In order to demonstrate plainly to yourself, what do you do? When you look in the mirror in the morning and you go, Does, am I a winner? The question you're asking is, am I keeping his what? Commandments. Am I doing what he said? If a person genuinely loves, that is actions, not feeling, it's not about how you feel, it's about what you're doing. If you genuinely love your fellow believers, if you genuinely love God, it should be evident, and you keeping his, they said with such fervor. Jesus says as much explicitly in John chapter 15, 8 through 11. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. How do you prove to be his disciple? Bearing much fruit. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love, which means dwell in, live in. Live in my love. I want you to live there. That's where I want you to dwell. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be more full. Anybody want to be joyful? Did you see the prescription? Keep his what? Commandments. Jesus has given us quite a few commands. These are indicators that if you want your life to bear fruit, if, if you want to do what Jesus intended you to do, if you want to be certain of your place with him, you are to keep his commands. Keep his commands. All of them. As he stated them, not as you would like to qualify them, not as you would like to justify yourself with them or make them fit the pattern of your current life. It means keep all of his commands in every circumstance and in every way. Is that tough? Yeah. So, do it. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 through 7. If you want to know that you're on the winning side here, if you want to know you've met the win condition, look for the testimony of three things. When all three agree, you're in the right place. 1 John 5, 4 through 7. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Winner. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. What does the word faith mean? Trust. When I ask you the question, what does faith mean? You say, 
trust. They are synonymous in the biblical text, uh, te- context. Right? The idea is I'm putting my confidence in something I have a reason to believe is true. Trust. When I have faith in God, I'm putting my confidence in him. This is the victory that overcomes the world. Our faith. Our faith in who? Yeah, God, particularly through the person of Jesus Christ. We trust him. Who is the one who overcomes the world? This is verse 5. But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood. Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood. All three are in agreement. Do you want to know if you are on the winning side? Do three agree? Let's look at the three. The blood. What is the blood a reference to? Christ's blood. And so this is where the faith comes in. Do I know that what he said about dying for me is true of me? Do I know that regardless of how much sin I'm bringing to the table, that he can forgive me and will accept me and draw me in? Do I believe, do I have confidence that that's happened? Does the blood agree that you're a winner? If you look at your life and you say, yes, I affirm your truth, Lord Jesus, check, that's a winner. One agrees. But what about the other? The water. The water is our response to his blood. It's our identification with him in Christian baptism. Was I baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ? If so, check. Colossians 2, 11 and 12. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands and the removal of the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. What is, the, what is this covenant circumcision of Christ that we're talking about? It's right there in verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism, into which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Baptism is a work of who? It's a work of God according to that text. Baptism is a work of God. So his blood has been shed for me. I have faith and confidence in it. I believe. The blood agrees. Does the blood agree with the water? I have responded to Christ by giving myself to him in Christian baptism. But thirdly, there's a third testimony here. It is the testimony of the Spirit. The ongoing presence of God in the believer is evidenced by the Holy Spirit. And how do you know if you've got the Holy Spirit? Well, you should be bearing what kind of fruit? Really simple. The fruit of the Spirit, right? Uh, and this is, this is clear in the Scriptures. Love. Are you loving? Love. Joy. Peace. Patience. Kindness. Goodness. Gentleness. Self-control. I believe in Jesus Christ. The blood proclaims it. I have accepted him through Christian baptism. I've embraced it through the watery baptism. But is my life bearing the fruit of the Spirit? When people look at me, do they see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control? And is it increasing each year? As I look back at myself last year and the year before, do I see that I've just grown in the Spirit? Do I see this in increasing measure? The good news is if the three agrees, the three agrees, the three does agree, um, you can know that you're part of the saved. You can have confidence, full confidence, not because you're good, but because he is. And it's a good condition to be in when you realize you can't lose. That seems, that seems like, does that seem arrogant? Does that seem narcissistic? It does if you think it comes from you. Does anyone think that they are the means of their own salvation in this room? By no means. We said that God can't lose. And because God can't lose, if you are found to be with God, you cannot lose. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 8 as we wrap up today. Romans 8. If we belong to God, how could we possibly lose? Romans 8 is one of the most beautiful passages in the whole of the Bible. I hope you're familiar with it. You've got to read Romans 6 and 7 before you really get a full sense of what's happening in Romans 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us. How will he not also with him, with Jesus, freely give us all things? It's this, it's this wonderment that Paul's looking at and he's going, how can I lose now? Like, did you see who he offered for me? 
Did you see what God did in order to get relationship with me? How could I possibly be in a situation where I lose knowing that this is the case? Could any person outside of me mess this up? Look at verse 33. Who could bring a charge against God's elect? I want you to think of a courtroom setting here. Who could bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, he who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. So here's the question. It's like a courtroom. It's like you're going into a courtroom to defend your life. And as you walk into that courtroom, you look up and who's on the stand? It's your father. And he loves you dearly. And you look down to see the prosecuting attorney, attorney, and it's Jesus who loves you intimately. And then you look at the defendant, and it's Jesus, right? Because he's the only one who could rightly condemn you, couldn't he? It's Jesus. It's his righteousness that we have to appease, but he's also the one defending you. Oh, and by the way, he's also the one who's paid your whole prison sentence already. And so Paul's looking at the situation. He's like, think about what we've got going on here. We cannot lose. If you are in this condition, if you're found in Christ, you cannot lose. Could some life circumstance ruin it? Well, could it? The answer is a resounding no. Look at verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Do you hear what he's saying here? What Paul's saying? I could do this all day. What, are you going to kill me? You're going to beat me up? You're going to starve me to death? That's fine. People of God experience that kind of stuff all over the world. Can that separate me from God? If there is any question in your mind that experiencing sickness or suffering or disease or persecution being poor, being in danger, being impoverished on any level, if there's any question that that means God does not love you, do you see what this passage is saying? That can't separate you from God. That in no way separates you from God. That doesn't do a thing to diminish your relationship with him. Are these evidences that we're not winners if I'm suffering? No, it's quite the opposite. Who did we say had a vested interest in making you suffer? The devil, right? And so Jesus said, hey, if they hate me, they're going to hate you too. If they persecuted me, don't think they're not going to persecute you. A servant is not greater than the master. Verse 37, but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer. In all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer. In all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer conquer through him who loves us for i am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of god which is in christ jesus our lord i want you to think about what that says for a moment it says that there is a tie there is a bond that has been constructed through the blood of christ through baptism into him, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, which is a down payment, a deposit on who you will be for eternity. When those things are present, what's what's being said is that there's a tie to God, a relational tie to him. And what Paul's saying here to the church in Rome is if the devil, if all of the devil's minions, if every angelic power, if the whole cosmos were turned into a pair of scissors and it tried to sever that bond, it would fail miserably. It would be like safety scissors trying to cut a steel beam. It can't be done. Nothing, nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of Christ, your Lord, my Lord. Do you know your mission statement? Do you know who you are meant to be? Do you know your win condition? Do you understand what the devil is trying to accomplish in space-time history? Do you know what God is all about? If you have clarity on these things, you're going to have clarity in most of life, certainly in your spiritual battles. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Your salvation we do not want to take for granted. What you have set about to accomplish, what you accomplished on the cross and through your resurrection has us in standing in wonder. Lord Jesus, I pray that uh, not only 
that you have thwarted the devil, but that we thwart the devil by performing the actions you've set forth for us. That we're faithful, diligent to fight these battles. Father, that we might be found winners when all is said and done. May three agree in each of us. In your name we pray. Amen. If you liked what you saw here, go ahead and click on that like button. And while you're at it, for more great content, go ahead and subscribe to our channel.